Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, we have about 40 packs with us joining this live webinar session today. Thank you for coming on board. Uh, my name is Pamela. I'm from the Social Enterprise Accredita Accreditation Team in MAGIC. I will be co-hosting this webinar session today with Kim from Picha Eats, whereby she will be moderating a panel discussion later. Um, just a quick background about this webinar. Um, with the recent outbreak of COVID-19, we see significant impact on not just public health, but also the economy. We understand that like all businesses out there, our social enterprises are exposed to similar disruption and challenges. We hope that through today's interactive discussion, our speakers are able to share their perspective on what's happening out there to help our social enterprises build resilience to their strategy for months to come. Um, MAGIC is very glad to be hosting a panel of experts, um, which consists of Inchit Rizal, Ganesh, Mason, Nicholas, Dasri, and of course, Kim. A big thank you to all our speakers for joining us today. Uh, moving on to agenda, we will first start with a fireside chat with Nicholas to give some perspective on the macro impact of COVID-19 and the way forward. This will then be followed by a panel discussion uh, themed around Rise Above COVID-19, moderated by Kim. Just a couple of notes before we start. Um, if the audience have any specific questions, please do submit them at the Q&A section. Uh, we'll try to pick a few to answer towards uh, the end if time permits. And, and second, all views and opinions represented by our speakers in this webinar are personal. They solely belong to them and do not represent those of the organization they are attached with. So without further ado, um, let's kickstart our fireside chat. Hi, Nick. Hi, Pam. How are you? Hi, good. How are you? Uh, it's been a long, long week, but I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. No worries. Thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Um, looking at your profile, I think you're the right person that I can ask if you can give a brief overview from a macro perspective, how sure. the COVID outbreak has actually impacted our economy now and maybe for months to come. And if you can actually zoom into um, how the impact specific for SMEs. Sure. So uh, the thing about the COVID-19, uh, there's a lot of things that are being written about it and projections and so on. I think the important thing to keep in mind is that Nothing can ever really go back to normal unless it's a vaccine that's found. And a vaccine based on some, even the most optimistic projection of when a vaccine can be ready is within 18 months. So even if you find a vaccine now, uh, the normal process for a vaccine to be approved is it needs to be tested out for like a year or so to make sure that the vaccine doesn't kill the, 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 the person is trying to cure, make sure there's no mm. long-term side effects and that kind of thing. Um, and so you, you can only get a vaccine 18 months. Until there's a vaccine, uh, we have to depend on some of the measures that you see other countries are doing. And these range from things like total lockdown. So Wuhan, for example, was in total lockdown to the Korea model, which allows business to go on as usual, but with really mass testing everywhere. Um, so Malaysia is somewhere in between there. We're trying to ramp up the testing. Uh, at the same time, we are also not really on a full lockdown. We are on a movement control order. Um, so, but you can expect that because many businesses are closed. So I would say from the SME point of view, probably 70% of SMEs are forced to close during this time because they're not listed as essential services. Uh, and uh, because they employ uh, about 70% of the private sector workforce, uh, this doesn't include civil servants and so on. So the loss of uh, income to SMEs means that they have to take some measures on the staff, which could include, uh, you know, retrenchment uh, and the most extreme, but also some reorganization of how they deal with leaves and so on. And so what you will end up seeing is that there's going to be a huge loss in consumption as well as economic activity. And I don't expect that um, it will pick up quickly. I think that any recovery back to some form of normalcy is gradual. I mean, you think about it, right? Like uh, if they tell you that tomorrow uh, we are going to do mass testing, there's no vaccine yet, but we'll open up the economy. How many people do we really think are going to go out big into malls and things like that? There's going to be some time 
that I think before economic activity can really pick up. And for me, I think uh, the vaccine is probably when you can get back to normal. Until then, we should expect a very subdued economy. Okay, thank you. So you mentioned on loss uh, uh, or reduction in consumption or loss in economic activities. Um, sure. How bad is it compared to you know, our previous glo uh, global financial crisis and perhaps the Asian one? Sure. Um, so the yeah. Asian financial crisis and the global financial crisis are financial crisis. So uh, the difference then is that while the financial crisis meant that, that people lost jobs, people lost homes, and uh, there were very serious consequences, nobody had to, no industry or no sector had to stop working if they, if, they did, if, they, if, they, if they didn't want to. Now the difference is A, you have a health crisis at the bottom of it, leading to an economic crisis that if we're not careful could lead to a financial crisis. The health crisis means that we actually have to close off the economy, which we didn't do under the Asian financial crisis and we didn't do under the global financial crisis. And that I think is, uh, will have an ultimately a bigger impact because if you already have a crisis, there's going to be some loss in economic output in GDP, but now you're forcing to close as well. And that is something that we've not seen. Okay, how, how is it different from the, our previous SARS experience? Yeah, so, the, so that's a great question. I think mm. uh, there's two channels on this. One is the difference in the diseases themselves, and one is the difference in the global context. So SARS was, um, uh, at that time, was a more deadly uh, disease. I think 10% fatality rate compared to now about 2% for COVID. But it didn't spread as widely. And more importantly, uh, COVID is asymptomatic. Meaning that, you know, just because you don't have symptoms doesn't mean you don't have it. SARS, you always had the symptoms. You always knew when someone had SARS. And also the COVID-19 is from a novel coronavirus. And therefore, there's no immunity anywhere that has been developed towards it. Where SARS, there was some. It wasn't from a novel coronavirus. Uh, from a global point of view, uh, when SARS was hitting us in 2003, China wasn't $13 trillion worth of economic output. China wasn't the... the, the the global manufacturer just yet. It was just starting out. So the size of China at that time was still relatively small to the role that it plays in today's economy and therefore the impact they can have on global supply chains um, and economic production everywhere. So the, 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 the real difference is actually on the size of China today versus mm -hmm. what it was back then. So it sounds like um, the recovery for COVID might be a bit slower than SARS? Uh, I don't know about the recovery just yet because yeah. governments are much quicker to report uh, to respond to COVID this time around compared to yeah. SARS. Yeah. But uh, I think the 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 the, the trial or the the down the, the downfall in economic growth will be more serious, far more serious than in SARS. But the recovery yeah. depends. Uh, the 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 worry is also multiple waves of the pandemic because historically pandemics don't come in just one wave, so yeah. we might see repeat. Uh, waves and so on, usually less than the first wave. Now we're in the first wave. Um, mm. So uh, there should still be some economic uh, consequences later on. But I would say that governments have been quite serious in responding to a lot of the economic uh, threats that are out there that come from the coronavirus. Okay, that leads on to my next question with um, the recent announcement from government, all the release and existence. Do you yeah. think um, it's uh, our SEs can leverage on it because I, I guess the pool is limited in the sense that, you know, you can't, um, not everyone uh, can take a cut of that. What's your view on that? Sure. So for the social enterprises, um, you know, the, the benefits that you would get come almost primarily from whatever benefits that the government is giving to the SMEs. So I think if we think about what came up in the Prihatin uh, stimulus package, uh, directionally, I think it was correct. They decided to give some waste subsidies. They, they, they gave a bit more financing on the balance sheet, uh, although it's not clear necessarily that problems are on the balance sheet rather than the income statement. And I think, uh, you know, th things like certain cuts in electricity, free internet and so on, directionally correct. But I think uh, SMEs probably need a bit more because, you know, um, the median wage in Malaysia is 2,400 ringgit uh, and uh, the support you're getting is 600 ringgit. So SMEs need more because otherwise they have to pay the, the, the whatever's left over the 600. And there was a report that Maybank released which uh, showed that, which said that SMEs really only have two weeks to two months, the, the, the range of cash reserves. So if this thing continues on, 
uh, especially for sectors which are non-essential, then uh, we might need to see, we might start to see some businesses having to close down or laying off workers and things like that. But the uh, stuff for S, uh, social enterprises, I would say um, they didn't really distinct, you know, they didn't really split between social enterprises and SMEs for the purposes of the budget. So most of it is really based on how they feel they can tap into the SME side of it. Yeah. So um, do you think the private sector then should, should come in and assist? I mean, I mean they, they are solving their own challenges as well, but yeah. uh, can they play a role in, in this? Well, I think one way that we can think about is that uh, as some countries decide to uh, figure out how they re... It, 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 okay, so first of all, they're short term and long term. Uh, short term, I don't see what, uh, how the private sector would necessarily help because you're right, they're firefighting on their own. And if anything, they will help with CSR stuff, which is not necessarily, you know, support for social enterprises. But the second thing also is that if we look at um, how countries might choose to realign their, their procurement, uh, especially when you cannot import from certain places anymore, that sort of thing, then maybe there's a role to be played for SMEs and therefore for social enterprises. Um, but in the short term, I think it's quite hard for the private sector to really support uh, unless they can shift the procurement, shift uh, some of the services things uh, quite quickly. And, but top of mind for them probably wouldn't be that at the moment. Uh, it actually be on making sure that the business manages to survive uh, whatever, mm. the, however long the MCO ends up lasting. Okay. Um, just how... Do you see a difference between the recovery traction for a social enterprise and maybe a conventional SME? Uh, I think uh, not necessarily in that sense. I think it really comes down to how well the enterprise in social enterprise works, meaning that, uh, you know, how well run were you as a business before? Um, if you were fairly well run, you, you, you managed to keep some cash reserves uh, handy, uh, you don't have a lot of overhead, you know, that sort of part, the business part of it, then I think you can recover quite quickly. But I think that's also true for both SMEs and social enterprises. Um, the social part of it, well, um, it kind of depends on what social, because there's just so many, right, that social enterprises might want to tackle. I can't narrow down for sure, but, um, you know, things like <clears throat> food and all might, 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 might come back a bit more quickly as, the MCOs lifted uh, because we still need to distribute that uh, as people are coming out of this uh, crisis. But I think it really comes down to how well your enterprise was run, you know, the business fundamentals behind your social enterprise uh, before um, the crisis hit. So the, the, the more, the more businessy your processes were and so on, the, the higher the chances of coming out of this uh, less unscathed. So, so at times like this, I think um, upskilling and reskilling is quite key. Um, yeah. what, what, what's your thought on this and what kind of areas that maybe our social enterprises should take advantage at this time um, to really take on that skill for maybe yeah. so, um, for months to come? Yeah. Sure. So I think for those who have the privilege to do so, and by this I mean that you're not worried about where your next meal might come. I know that uh, so many of our fellow Malaysians are worried about where the next meal may come. I think if you have to worry about that, you should sort that out first because survival matters more than anything else. But if you are able to at least stay afloat for the time being, and if you are in a social enterprise, um, I'd really work on building the resilience of uh, the enterprise part of it. Um, again, I, I'm not an entrepreneur, um, so I don't want to be too prescriptive as well. But I think that what I've seen, at least in businesses, um, what the COVID-19 has really shown us is how fragile businesses can be, uh, mm -hmm. especially when something quite um, substantial can happen. But if you think about this year alone, right? You know, in January, we had the Australian wildfires. In February, you got the coronavirus spreading. In March, oil crisis, financial crisis start happening. I, 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 it's not, I mean, I don't know if it's going to happen once a month, but like, I think we should be more wary of shocks in the future because of how interconnected mm -hmm. we are. But that also means that the more resilient your business is, the better chance you have of being sustainable. And that's where I would look at. Uh, but again, just, you know, I'm not an entrepreneur and I don't want to presume to be able to give advice where it's not warranted. Sure. But I do sure. think that uh, businesses that are more resilient in terms of how you run a business will definitely stay afloat for longer. 
Okay. Um, you've mentioned that right now it's pretty much like a mandatory um, stop to manufacturing, literally the economy itself. But once the MCO is uh, lifted, the uh, yeah. restriction order is lifted, how fast do you think recovery, uh, demand especially, it will recover? My view is that it'll take some time, uh, but mm. there is a lot of pent up demand. Uh, people have been storing cash. People have yep. been you know, wanting to go out, wanting to do all of that. So I, I, mm. I do think that... Um, that will increase, but I think it might take some time because the social scarring of sorts will take, I mean, like how many of us will really want to go to a crowded shopping mall for the time being? Yeah. Or even go to a cinema on, a, on the, the release, like if the Avengers Endgame was like released tomorrow, how many of us would really I know, want? yeah. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with social behavior. And for mm. that one, you know, I we can only guess, uh, I have a column in the Edge coming out tomorrow where I talk about some of the social behaviors we might see, but okay. I'm not certain that uh, it will be quite quick to pick up now because we have. I think we, we need to get used to a situation where people are going to be a lot more cautious than before about the way they sure. interact and the way they, they, they go about their daily lives. Yeah. Okay. Um, just ending this session, um, sure. any tips for um, from you to our social enterprises? How they can maneuver uh, through 2020? Um, I, think, yeah. I think I wish you all the best. Stay alive. Survive. Uh, try to take care of your staff if you can because they, they're going to mm. suffer. Um, the good thing is that the government does give some support for individuals as well, besides the SMEs. Um, mm. But if you can survive, and if you can survive, then start to think about the next steps, which is uh, building the resilience, I would say, of the business, and then maybe what can come after. Um, the, the what can come after is quite hard because I think there are just so many different sectors or things that people are involved in. But mm. yeah, uh, survive first, I think, if you can. Okay. And all the best to all of you. It's going to be a long haul, I think. Uh, but yeah. I, get, I guess we're all in this together. Um, so yeah. we should all support each other. Um, thanks, Nick. Thanks very much. Sure. Um, I think you kind of give a good starter to, to this webinar session and a preamble to our next session. Uh, so uh, before we go on to the panel discussion, we will now launch a poll um, to kind of get a sentiment from the ground. So um, you probably can see something pop up right in front of you. If you can just put, put in your votes, we'll give the audience probably maybe a minute to vote. Meanwhile, um, just a quick over, uh, overview of the next session. So this panel discussion uh, intends to uh, deep dive into certain areas uh, of challenges that our social enterprises are facing at the moment. So together with the panel of speakers, we will discuss areas including financial planning, business and impact strategy, uh, working capital management, um, and people leadership. So Kim will be moderating the session. Um, Nick, feel free to chip in uh, anytime. Um, let's, maybe we can show the results on the poll. And maybe over to you, Kim. You can, you can take over from here. Okay, um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Kim and I'm the CEO of Feature Eats. We run like um, a social enterprise or basically a food business that rebuild lives of refugees in Malaysia. So uh, very much in, in a lot of interaction with refugees uh, that are now currently residing in Malaysia temporarily. Uh, so I'm quite honored to actually host this panel uh, with such uh, amazing like a range of like panel speakers uh, so I'm just going to like um, introduce them one by one and then uh, we'll dive deep into like certain questions and if you all have any questions along the way put into the chat group uh, so that we can uh, like direct the question if you can be as specific as possible that'd be great uh, and then put your questions as uh, as short or as, uh, uh, as specific like very clear with what your question is, then uh, we can we are be we will be able to put in as much content as possible in the next forty to fifty minutes. Okay, so uh, and so we have like Anchi Rizal with us, who is the CEO of Alliance Islamic Bank. Uh, maybe Anchi Rizal can just like hi. <laughs> um, hey everyone, happy to be here. Yeah, so with his 25 years of experience in the business advisory and banking and finance sector, he will share more a bit about um, in the banking sector, what are the things that they'll be assisting um, uh, SMEs or hopefully SEs in the future. And, uh, and then the next one is uh, we have Mason, who is an impact investor. Hi, Mason. Hi, everyone. Thank you. 
Yep. So uh, Mason is a uh, uh, CEO and co-founder of the Garden Impact Investment. So having investing in like uh, the Southeast Asia's uh, social enterprise and sustainable enterprises, uh, he'll share a bit about what uh, support that impact investors can uh, provide or are, or, or, are, or, or are already providing and his view in the impact investing space right now. Uh, and then we have like Ganesh. Hey, Ganesh. Hi, Hi, good afternoon, everyone. All right, so here. cool. So Ganesh leads the working capital management practice within deals in PwC Malaysia. So um, he helps like his clients to improve their cash flow and reducing costs. Uh, so very much on operational side, um, how can we uh, survive through this uh, crisis? That 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 is uh, what he's mostly going to share about. And then uh, we have Dasrik. Hi guys, I uh, hope everyone have a good afternoon. Yep, so Dashrik basically leads like the CSET, uh, and, uh, in, uh, CSET Malaysia and with his experience leading initiatives or engagement within the SE ecosystem, he'll share more a bit about the leader's perspective point of view. Um, yep, so very cool to have these uh, panels, uh, but I'm going to straight away start off with questions like, um, about addressing like what social enterprises are currently facing. So uh, with this, uh, Dasri can uh, definitely share a bit about uh, with your interaction on ground with the social enterprises that uh, you have been interacting. Uh, what are the key challenges that you see social enterprises are currently facing right now? Yeah, thanks, uh, Kim and uh, Magic for organizing this. I think I think it's it's quite apt for us to do this, uh, and and I hope uh, this evening everyone would would be able to get some views and insights as well. Um, I, I'll I'll share a quick two minutes uh, sort of broad perspective. Then I think the the other panel would, would would deep dive into a bit more specifically. But but I guess in terms of landscape, there's there's three things that I wanted to share. The first is actually what. Nick kind of mentioned earlier about resiliencies. Um, I think I think that's important to contextualize into what does that mean for social entrepreneurship. Um, and second, also is with regards to the opportunities that lies either within the current COVID space uh, or post COVID to some extent. And and the third one I think is quite closely to to the social enterprises. I know a lot of practitioners here in terms of. Uh, uh, how do you move forward with this? But I'll, I'll, I'll go a bit light touch on this, and I think there's more questions uh, for the for the speakers, right? So as as a sector, I feel with all of this COVID that's happening, there's there's a sense to uh, to create more urgency for us to contextualize uh, what is social entrepreneurship in Malaysia. Now, if 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 it's not clear previously before COVID, I think I think a lot uh, conversations. Uh, kind of indicate that as is a, a, a bit of a hybrid, too much of a hybrid to, to, to be either in the micro SMEs or even the NGOs. So, so given to that context, a lot of our practitioners here, especially in Malaysia, are actually within these two forms. Either they're slightly more closer to um, the micro SMEs ataupun very close to the NGO side. And, and that's just by virtue of things in the Malaysian landscape. So I think now, given the, the, the current situation, there's an opportunity for us to sort of uh, organize that a bit better. The second thing I wanted to sort of anchor this conversation or set certain parameters is around this uh, private and public sector involvement. And I think Nick was mentioning around procurement, for example. Um, how does corporate sector also can actually be more uh, impactful beyond CSR? And now I know that's a long-term strategy, but I think it's a high time for us to, uh, as an ecosystem, to look into that. Uh, even for impact investors, which I hope I think Mason could also share this later, uh, there's a lot of things around uh, you know, not just focusing on unicorn, for example, then there's this term about zebra companies, for example, uh, can, can SE also be part of that uh, sort of uh, play? Um, and also, this is nothing new. I think I think it's just more of contextualizing and also pacing it out because previously, before COVID, corporates have been talking about SDGs anyway, sustainability and stuff like that. So how do we accelerate this with the social entrepreneurship scene, um, which hopefully it can be a mainstream in the new economy uh, when, when we go out of this. The, the third thing I think is quite important, and I think a lot of the focus of, of, of the conversation is around this. So if you're an SE, uh, I think it is very, very important now for you to acknowledge at least that it is business unusual. 
Um, and and I think I think some of our speakers later also will actually share this because that has to do with how do you do scenario and financial planning, for example. Uh, Nick was alluding to this earlier, right? In terms of cash flow, um, how much of a runway that you have. I think the poll also would actually help in terms of you to contextualize that. The other thing is actually quite important is to realign the expectation. I feel, and this expectation is not just to your customers, partners, and shareholders or stakeholders, but most importantly the beneficiaries that you're supporting uh, because they need to be prepared also to actually move forward with the turbulent times that were coming. And, and, and Nick, I, I like Nick mentioned this because pretty much what we're going through would shape what I consider as working in the new. Uh, and, and this has to do with, you know, there's been talks before this about IR 4.0, how do we digitalize, how we do, do community engagement differently, uh, things around talent, for example, right? So, so the way I see it is not all doom and gloom. But what situation that we're facing is pretty much just accelerating or creating some sense of urgency for us to pivot in terms of either way of working or do engagements and also um, how do we strengthen the ecosystem that we have or practitioners that we have in that sense. So I think, I think it's quite important to sort of frame in that way. So I know everyone is going through a tough time, but I think it's an opportunity for us to really look within ourselves to see how we could actually do this uh, better uh, in the future. And that's, to me, I think it's what resiliency is about moving forward. Back to you, um, yeah, so I, I think it's uh, very good that you start off with a very positive note. <laughs> and uh, I want to direct this question back to Mason right here because Mason is an impact investor. And uh, because we're talking about like we're addressing the challenges that social enterprises uh, that has, which Dasrik already uh, addressed. And so I want, like, I hope that Mason could share a bit, knowing that uh, you have invested in uh, an amount of like social enterprises. What uh, can you share with us, like, if there are any solutions taken by them that seem to be working right now, or what are the challenges that they have come across as well uh, in your in your portfolios? Well, thank you very much. Um, yes, this is uh, we are going through a very I would say extraordinary times. Uh, this is probably a situation where none of us have seen it before or even foreseen or forecast before. But first thing first, we always tell our social entrepreneurs, do not panic. Because the moment you panic, you cannot think clearly. You cannot strategize thinking. So we always tell them that, um, that before you speak to us, please make sure you know what are you going to talk about. Because unless you know your situation well, we cannot help you. You will really have to, but you have to face it with a realistic approach. Don't over promise to investors. So for us, we, the first thing that we sent out um, to our investee was after maybe it was like two weeks ago, saying that number one, call us if you need cash. Not because we are a bank or ATM machine, but call us if you need cash. Be honest with us. And number two, we will stand by you uh, in, to help with whatever resources we have. The resources is not necessary only through monetary, but through network, through network of our investors, through network of our supporters, how we can help in other way. The third thing is, of course, um, we are facing a real crisis. And of course, saving uh, the entity, the survival of the fittest is, is the gain. But it doesn't mean you become heartless. You know? So you still need to be uh, wary of uh, how to take care of your employees, including those you had terminated. So I think this is something that we want to show our humanitarian side, our compassion side. Um, you know, I have heard a few cases now in Malaysia whereby because of the MCO that is very difficult to access to food. It's easy within the urban area, but what about the rural area? We have never thought about it. And because of this uh, temporary shutdown, your food prices have shut up three times. So you must understand poor people, there are three fundamentals uh, that is remain unchanged. It is expensive to be poor. And number two, that these poor people do not have savings. It's unlike people who are in the middle class and upper class where we have savings. 
So all this we need to take into context of consideration when we discuss with our social entrepreneur. Don't just because of a profit first, then you start to you know uh, slash firing people. Uh, you know, I think so. These are some of the ways that we have been doing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, because just now we talk about like, um, I mean, Mason uh, talked about like having social entrepreneurs, you know, needing cash, call us, you know, if, if you really need help, call us. I guess I want to direct this uh, question to Unchick Result um, because we do have like uh, financial loans available, uh, which the bank has tried to work out like certain system for us to, uh, to, to help us get through this. So uh, I would like to, like ask in in the se standpoint is is it like logical or is it a good time to actually consider taking a finance assistance or uh, or loan right now uh, thanks kim um very pertinent question clearly um i'm going to try to address this in several ways because i think when we speak about social enterprises um, it's a wide breadth of definition uh, to simplify this, I'll speak about folks who are already bankable, so already have loans with banks. And for those who don't have loans with banks, then we might have to consider a different kind of approach. So there are a couple of things that are already in place for folks who are already taking loans from banks. Number one is clearly you have the moratorium, which is already introduced recently. And this is uh, emblematic of some of the other actions that are taken by governments around the world as well, both monetary as well as fiscal policy-wise. In Malaysia, at the very least, there's a six-month moratorium, no principal interest payments that frees up your cash flow somewhat. So in cases where you're a bit strained cash flow-wise to, uh, to take out payroll, to take care of suppliers, or to go out and do marketing and that kind of stuff, this moratorium will be useful. Yeah? Um, in Malaysia's case, for a, lot, for a lot of SMEs, for SMEs in fact, it's a blanket moratorium. So you don't really have to opt in for this. You will actually automatically opt it in into the program. Apart from that, there are five funds which have been introduced by the government uh, and the central bank uh, that amounts to more than three billion or so, which allows uh, sorry, 13 billion, which allows access by SMEs for emergency funding. So there's uh, special relief facilities, uh, facilities specific for particular sectors like agro or digitalization, um, and there's also an all sector uh, fund as well. Uh, in particular, there is one specific fund for microfinances, uh, so for, for microfinancing, for micro SMEs as well. And this can be accessed by, uh, by SMEs, including SEs as well. Um, like I said, now is the time to actually dash for cash, right? So if you're looking for an opportunity to, to um, reconsider your business model or you want to you want to look into how you can keep yourself afloat for the next four to six months i think accessing some of these funds would be uh, a logical a pragmatic thing to do um, for those who are not yet having loans or have not been banked by any bank at this point in time you can still access these funds now quite truthfully, because you'd be a new customer to a bank, the process may take a bit longer than if you're already a, a bank customer from a financing perspective. Um, but these loans are there, uh, these, um, these funds are there to be accessed via these banks and I would encourage social enterprises who are looking to actually improve their liquidity positions to actually um, uh, talk to their banks, uh, to talk to their bankers to try to access these funds. Uh, quite apart from that, you would have banks at this point in time going beyond just doing the financing role. Um, a lot of banks right now is, uh, are looking into how to help SMEs get through this difficult period. So beyond financing, there's help to actually do capacity building. There's training for those who want to uh, improve themselves, who want to rescale or upscale. We have banks such as ourselves as well who are looking into helping SMEs find markets, access markets to, uh, to market their products. And the way we do this is we work with NGOs who are looking to providing essentials to the poor and needy and inviting some of the SMEs in our customer base to actually supply to these NGOs. So these are little bits that uh, banks like ourselves are doing in order to help SEs uh, and SMEs in general to get past this next three to six months. But yes, I would, I would, I would call on SMEs and SEs to actually really look into the cash position at this point in time and try to access, uh, access the funds that they require in order to continue and survive. 
Yeah, so um, I actually like the, the fact that uh, that's, it's just not about loan, it's about training, it's about market access, it's about longevity. Um, and, and besides like getting a loan, uh, really assessing like, our, our cash flow, our, what is inside our bank right now, how much operational cost do we have to look into. So I'm going to direct this question to Ganesh um, because uh, we know that one of the key challenges for SE is to manage its thinning working capital. Uh, but before we go into talking about why is it so important during right now, can you explain a bit what working capital management is uh, to our fellow SEs? Hi, thanks, Kim. So working capital management is uh, basically how you can optimize your receivables, payables and inventory. You know, you want to make sure that at any one point in time, you have the least amount of capital tied up in those three areas. But really, a bit more broader, you have to look at working capital as a bigger picture in terms of cash flow management. And in relation to where we are today, right? one of the things that uh, would be of absolute paramount, right, is to, when we look at working capital, is together with the cash flow forecast, right? Um, a number of companies have seen, have done forecasts before, but that's before COVID-19, right? Now in, your, in, in this situation, the first thing you do before you approach a bank, before you approach your investors, I would strongly suggest you do like a, I would say a three months or a 13 week cash flow forecast not from an assumption-based perspective, but actually doing it ground up, actually figuring out when the invoices are sort of coming due, uh, when are you going to receive money from your clients, who, when would you get your supplies, right? So getting visibility of your daily cash flows, that I think is very paramount because then you know whether you can sort of tide over over the next three months or so. And based on that, the detailed cash flows that you've got, then you identify levers which you can play with. You know, Th that means, uh, do I need to go back to my uh, investor to ask more funds, or do I need to go to my supplier and see whether I can renegotiate in terms of payment terms, right? Or whether I could get actually a rebate. You know, or do I can I go to my customer and ask them if I could get early early payments or payments earlier than the uh, normal typical payment schedule. I think these are all the opportunities that are there if you have a detailed cash flow forecast. Um, so in, and, and, and we have to look at a cash flow forecast from an operational perspective. It's not just a financial, it's people on the ground, um, your operations guy, your supply chain chap, your marketing all need to get together. So you need to get all your team on board and get them to understand the visibility. Your employees need to know now, you know, where your cash position is, what is the potential forecast. They need to understand if they need to go and collect faster from the clients or if they're going to need to renegotiate with their suppliers. Um, Does that yeah. give uh, enough visibility? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ganesh. Um, I, we actually have a question from uh, the chat group. But before I get into that question, because it's more financing, um, you talked about like um, having to talk to our suppliers, our stakeholders, uh, our partners. So I want to direct this question to Dasrik because this is very much about um, uh, making challenges and decisions uh, that SEs need to make now like if you have already communicated all these things with your team members and, and your stakeholders, what, what kind of like, uh, what is the current, what, what, is the, what is the toughest challenge or decision that SEs need to make now? What do you think? Oh, well, well that's, that's, I feel that's a multiple dimension to it. I think, I think to, to be fair um, and, and to contextualize, I think the most pragmatic way, if, if you go back to your social business canvas or your BMC, business model canvas, the, the thing that you probably need to look into quite specific now is actually your cost structure and the revenue portion, the, the two portion at the below. Uh, because that would determine in terms of what you need to rationalize. Do you really need to retrench people? Uh, or even do you need to find new ways of working or your customer channel validations or whatever that may be? Um, and, and, and that, I, so, so I, I don't have a bullet, you know, silver bullet to answer that, but I feel once you understand that better, uh, get alignment with your partners, investors, stakeholders, whoever that may be, um, and always constantly communicate. And, and, and I feel at this point of time, don't sugarcoat. 
because once you sugarcoat the the, <laughs> the problem is there's always miscommunication so so then but but more than obvious i think i think nick was mentioning this i think i think uh, you know employability would drop um, I think by MSMEs, I think the, the contribution was 68% to labor force. Uh, technically, SE do fall under that. So, so and, and if the beneficiary segment of SEs are the B40 groups, the most vulnerable in the structure. So, so, so that would be one of the key considerations. But other than that, I think it's pretty much what Ganesh uh, mentioned earlier. So look into your business uh, based on data, I feel, not assumption. Um, and then communicate based what you know and 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 make your decision. Like, obviously, it's a hard decision, but need to be done. I feel. Yeah. So like, so like transparency and not you know sugarcoating on stuff. Be very straightforward of what's going to happen. Help your team or help everyone to uh, imagine a worst case scenario, just like what Mason uh, shared before. Um, but so I want to. Uh, there's a question here which I, I mentioned just now. Uh, the financial review criteria remains the same despite the low bo borrowing rate. So as an SE, our financial book may fall below such criteria. So is there a relaxation over this? I think this very much direct to either Anshik Riza or, or Ganesh that could help to address this. I'll just quickly pick up on this one. Yeah. Um, the funds that are provided at this point in time, I think, has very very relaxed criteria. Um, so it's collateral free. Um, we're looking at not that much in terms of uh, financial documentation, especially if you're already a customer of a bank, because that information will already be there. Um, the challenge would be more in terms of the banks actually catering for this. And I'll be, again, the theme seems to be not to sugarcoat stuff. But at this point in time, you would find that there is a lot of bottleneck at the banks because there is a rush for help from many. Now, what I would suggest is that for folks to actually still persevere because the lines, even though they may be blocked, keep calling, try to get through. You can go to, uh, you can even fill up callback forms just so that these contact center folks can call you back later. Um, it's, it's um, we're trying to do the best we can at this point in time. I think every bank is trying to do the best uh, they can, but clearly these funds are, are there um, to be accessed uh, and, and for us to help them access it as well. All right, uh, Ganesh, do you want to add anything? Um, I, I think what Rizal said is uh, pretty much uh, spot on. I mean, the, uh, I, and I know a, a few of my friends, I think, as they, you know, getting, getting in touch with the banks, getting in touch with the hotlines, yes, it's an issue at, at this juncture. So, uh, again, in these kind of uh, circumstances, you need to be innovative, you know. So, what some of them did is they tried to find contacts in the banks, you know, who then knew someone else who, you know, who, who could put them in touch with the right person. So not just relying on one way, but you have to be agile and innovative in terms of trying to approach to the, to the banker or to any of your fund providers. Okay, uh, cool. Um, so I, I, because we're, we're, we're kind of like a social enterprise, like enterprise driven by impact. Uh, so I want to also talk to a, a bit about like the impact side of things with Mason. So like we know like we're always trying to, like as an, as an SE, you're trying to balance out commercial return and its uh, impact strategy. So with the current situation, do you think it's time for SE to make the tough call to choose between business and impact? What is your uh, suggestion to this? You always ask me the tough question. Uh, yeah, you, because I know you can answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, it's a tough call, but I would like to... Um, suggest to all the SE, don't give up your passion. Um, you know, we need to be realistic. Yes, we are not like in the glorious day, but we need to be uh, realistic and yet hopeful. Um, so it depends the kind of funders or stakeholders that you are working with. Uh, if you have a very supportive stakeholders, they will say, continue to do it. Uh, find a way to survive first. Then we talk about your growth story. But if you mix with the wrong kind or different kind of investors, then you're probably facing a lot of stress, facing a lot of situation whereby maybe this is not the right partnership. And so I think it is very much depend on your current situation. That's why I always tell SE, be careful. Don't be attracted by cheap money. People may offer you very attractive financing, 
But when it comes to crunch time like this, when they don't share your vision, then you know you feel that a lot of stress. But again, you shouldn't be so stubborn. You must be teachable because everywhere is being disrupted. Every industry is being disrupted. If you still insist your model pre still works uh, as is pre-COVID-19, then we are also questioning, are you daydreaming? Because um, this is something that, again, it is, it's very much depend on, on how your stakeholders will come in to help you to do the journey. Yeah. So I think there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, quick answer to say that whether you should, uh, you know, be realistic, uh, drop everything and change or, or stick to what your vision is. But I think you cannot change your passion. You know, your passion is something that is going to drive you through the up and downs in this journey as a social entrepreneur. So. Yeah, I think the answer pretty much like throw it back to the social entrepreneur themselves to reassess, same as what Ganesh uh, mentioned, to reassess where you are um, and, and really understand, is it time to, you know, go further or is it time to reserve and, and see how uh, we can go through this together? Um, so I, I really like like Ralph sharing this uh, very inspiring note here. Mountain tops inspires us, but valleys nurture us. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, okay, so I have we have a question here. Uh, I think it's very much to uh, a bit more leadership. Uh, so how to assure how to assure all stakeholders that my SE can survive and thrive, and with new energy to rise above this storm. I'll open this to anyone who wants to share, um, but maybe Dashrit can try, can, 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 can address this. Yeah, the, the, the reality is, and I'm being pragmatic about it, right? So, so I, I, I opened my conversation earlier of, of saying the problem statement that uh, SE is much of a two hybrid between NGOs and uh, small medium entities, right? So, so, so to be pragmatic about it, it's actually, it's okay. And, and I feel it's okay if it's almost like SE, what we're going through now, we need to go into an evolution form. <laughs> if we're slightly closer to the NGOs to survive, yes, go with the NGO form. Regardless of whatever your stakeholders say, to, as a matter of survival, just do it. Uh, and, and if you're slightly closer to the SMEs, uh, then yeah, by all means. Now, the, 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 the reason why I ask you to kind of like pseudo force fit into that because it keeps things simple for you to move forward, I feel. Whether with regards to government uh, benefits or with regards to any incentive packages that are coming out into the stimulus package. Um, but the, the, the overarching theme here is actually always constantly communicate. Uh, whether to your stakeholders, beneficiaries, whatever, so that everyone kind of know what you're going through and hopefully they'll actually be on board with you guys. So two things are, one is actually communicate, but the, 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 the bigger picture is actually reassess yourself. I think what Mason, Ganesh and also Cheriza has been saying throughout. So that's the key fundamental thing I feel. Thanks for making it very clear, reassessing, communicate, being very transparent. Um, anyone has one more uh, advice or input, very short and sweet one. I, I, think, I, I run the sorry. risk of uh, I run the risk of repeating myself. Um, this is a classic case of you do need to have your cash flow forecast really done up properly, because then you would know yourself where the, where the buffers are, where the levers to play, and whether you do need to innovate yourself by you know for example some businesses moving from offline to online to new generate new revenues, and then you can show them the facts. This the facts is based on realities on the ground on your cash flow forecast and you can then show this, I've got these uh, buffers to tide me over. You know, that's one view that I, I have to share. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I want to tie back to the reality right now uh, because we do have some major decisions to be making as a SE. So between the liquidity, which is more short term, and solvency, which is more long term, um, how can one balance between these two, or is there a priority over the other? So I'll direct this to Anshik Rizal and Ganesh to uh, fill, it, fill, fill us in. It's a quick one, right? Um, look, if, were, if your issue is liquidity, that means cash on hand at this point in time, go dash for that cash. So go for that first. 
I think you, you kind of need to have a time horizon of no more than four weeks in this kind of current situation. So you need to look into what it takes for you to survive the next four or even six weeks. And if you can do that, you can plan for much a longer period. So I think liquidity would override anything if that's your issue currently. If liquidity is not your issue, then um, maybe it's a point of time to, to look into what your, your overall capital structure, whether you want to have more debt or you want to have more equity, that's a conversation you need to have with your own stakeholders and uh, as part of your own plans for how you want to grow the SE as well. Uh, Ganesh? I, I concur with the uh, result. I mean, in time of crisis, liquidity always uh, trumps, uh, you know, solvency or profitability. It's not about the, the loss you need to, to incur or the cost you need to incur. It's can you survive through this period, you know? Um, so yes, so you must take solvency ahead of, uh, sorry, uh, liquidity ahead of solvency for sure. Thank you. Uh, I, we have a question right here. I think uh, Mason could really help to address this because of the businesses that you are interacting with. Um, is there any example of a social business that you come across that has shown such resilience during this time and then how they have grown and adapted uh, to this challenging landscape right now? Okay. Um, one of the interesting thing that model that I see now is online education. Uh, because of this uh, so-called stay-home notices, many people are, are unable to access to go to physical school. So I have seen a boom in the online education system. And of course, another area is because of the current uh, situation, healthcare is, uh, is something that many people are looking at as well. And so providing uh, even donation charity for healthcare, because there are a lot of people who need uh, access to affordable health care. And we have seen cases whereby uh, a huge rise in uh, donations and charity money to give to urgent cases, medical cases. Don't forget, this crisis, health crisis, is not only on those who are COVID-19. There are also who have heart attacks. There are people who have cancer. There are people who are suffering stroke as well. So I think um, the community of uh, family of foundations and charity, CSR, I think we need to rise up. So I think there are a lot of opportunities in the other area as well. Okay, um, well, we talk about like being online and uh, being digital. Uh, I know there are a lot of SE that right now, which I have some conversation with some of them as well. Uh, many of them are operating very limitedly like from home. Uh, uh, from with digital uh, and, and internet. Uh, so in Dastrick's point of view is uh, how should the entrepreneurs lead with trust and efficiency at this time? Because right now we're actually into our 16th or 17th day. And I realized that many people are running out of ideas to, and to make sure that the team mem members are being engaged via online. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, uh, so so it's a tactical question, right? So so there's 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 many many ways. I think uh, you know, I I, I follow Picha Eats also. So I think I think Picha Eats launched very good campaigns in terms of uh, engagement wise. So it's either to to employees, to stakeholders, and stuff like that. So so if if you ask from a practitioner standpoint, I think do campaigns. Uh, the the idea here is actually still communicate lah, right? So so whether it's stakeholder, keep them engaged, keep them high up on board do the same with your beneficiary as well whether it's capacity building just check-ins and stuff like that that's quite important uh, but i would extend that thought right so so i'm almost inclining to say what we're going through now is actually it will be the the way of workings in the new so if you could actually sustain not as a temporary stopgap measure in terms of communicating, digitalizing, or using digital as a platform, I think there's a lot of propositions for your SE or any businesses phone um, to write on this digital platform and do things differently moving forward when we, we go out of this. So, so think slightly broader, I feel, um, to, 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 to do engagements uh, beyond the COVID-19 and see if we could replicate this out of COVID-19 or so in the future. Okay. Uh, I just want to like quickly address this. Uh, someone is a newly registered SE with Magic. They want to get in touch with Mason or Dasrik. 
uh, for guidance and growth or sustainability? Is this available? Yes, I'm uh, available to consult. Yes, I'm almost everywhere, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just get connected. You can definitely connect with Magic and see what they can do for you. Um, but I also want to open this question, uh, number four, with uh, anyone here, uh, any of the panel can share, uh, because it's related to the government. So uh, how can the state government support early stage SEs during these challenging times? State no, government, right, yeah. Yeah, so a quick one, I think. I think I think it's no different of what uh, we or even Magic wanted to sort of push for uh, at 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 a, at a macro level, right? So so I think there's a high time and high opportunity for us to do more of uh, social procurement uh, in a more broader context in the UK, for example. There's uh, a lot of social enterprises are involved in the social service delivery. Um, so whether it's a maintenance of playgrounds, maintenance of stadiums and stuff, even Singapore is doing this. So, so what we're hopeful is actually to emulate that while we see the stimulus package is just that three to six months, but we try to steer the conversation to slightly broader in terms of residencies. Um, so for example, you know, the, 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 the direct cash, for example, is, is directly to the B40, but why can't social enterprise be an enabler uh, of employment opportunities for B40 at a scale, for example. And this can go beyond the six months. Uh, so, so that's what I mean by contextualizing SE uh, for Malaysia, I feel. So, so you know, it, those are the current thinkings of going about it. But, but, but I think that's probably one of the way, lah. Um, social procurement, get SEs be part of, you know, procurement. I think that's what uh, the acc uh, accreditation for SEA is doing anyway. But I think it's a high time to scale that. I feel there's an opportunity to do that given the current circumstances. Yeah, so talking about like procurement is very much related to the livelihoods of like the, the, the people that we are trying to impact in the SE. So directing to Ganesh, uh, so one of the key elements of the SEs are their, their, the target beneficiaries that uh, we are working with. They are, they are part of our workforce and our supply chain, especially like in Picha as well. Refugees are like part of our supply chain. So uh, during the optimization of the working capital requirements, how can SE minimize the negative impact to their target beneficiaries? Okay. Um... Not sure whether I can I can answer this um, currently. Um, so I, I think the, the 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 key the key point here is that uh, we need to have or the SEs need to have or need to make sure they have sufficient cash flow. And if we talk about procurement, um, we they they do they do need to see if the procurement that they are into is it um, is it uh, sorry maybe I, I can I clarify the question. When you're talking about the target beneficiaries, is the SEs is providing funding to the target beneficiaries or? No, so the, the target beneficiaries are part of our supply chain, it means they are part of our workforce. Ah, but right okay. now, uh, not just like the, the team members uh, in, the, in the work, uh, sorry, in the company is uh, going through hard times, even the beneficiaries are going through hard times as well. Yeah. Uh, Ganesh, we, I can't, we can't get you. Um, I don't think we get you. Is it me or like is is? Yeah, I think his his earphone is not working. Maybe we put the question aside. Uh, we'll. Uh, can uh can let me. Okay. Um. Then. We're talking, oh, I think, but I think this one, like Mason can help to address as well. Um, so can you repeat the question? What you want me to focus? So basically, basically like the, the beneficiaries that we're working with, they're part of our workforce, right? Uh, yes. And then, so how, how do we reduce that negative impact on them at this uh, current situation? Sure. So for us, uh, for example, one of our... Uh, portfolio companies in Malaysia have uh, reduced uh, or rather retrenched their staff workforce from 40 staff to 15 staff. So during the discussion, recent discussion, I was uh, more concerned about what is happening to the 25 staff who have been retrenched. 
And I said, you know, why I'm asking this? Because you know at the moment they cannot find a job and they will be uh, forced to do something. They need to feed their family. So I said, can, have, can we at least consider give them a daily or weekly allowance, meal allowance for the retrenched staff? Tie them through this difficult period because even those who are not being retrenched, they are also, also facing the food inflation costs. So we will need to make sure we feed them. We cannot be hung, try to make sure they are not hungry. So this is some of the extraordinary steps that we are taking because we know this is not a, uh, going to last just for, for a, a temporary or a few weeks. I think I foresee this going to last for another six months or so. So, um, so this is not just impacting Malaysia, but it's globally as well. So I think we need to be mentally prepared that to stretch out to uh, as help as much as possible. Um, you know, you may think, um, I mean, it's not a, a lot of money, but you know, I think it's essential from a humanitarian perspective, reaching out, helping these beneficiaries uh, because they are part of the ecosystem. Okay, thank you so much for addressing that. Uh, I think we, I've almost done with all the questions. I, I'm very, very glad that the panel make it really short and very precise and very crystal clear, um, which is very, uh, very encouraging. Um, so I, I probably want to end, if, if there's any more questions, please quickly send them in. Uh, I just want to end this question. Uh, there's one, sorry, um, there's one question from Mason. A uh, few investors have been saying that there's going to be an uptick of investment post COVID-19. So just want to ask from investor point of view, do startup and SEs need to focus on maximizing revenue or, uh, or maximizing profit to get investors interest post COVID-19? Um, yeah. So again, it depends on what is your passion is. Um, for me, I believe a, a good social enterprise should also be financially sustainable. Only a, a sus financially sustainable social enterprise can deliver sustainable social impact. So I think we must not forget because simply because you are a social enterprise, you can ignore the financial sustainability issue. It is a very important issue because uh, this is where our social impact investors come, come in. They are not interested, they are tired of uh, you know, giving away money on a charity basis. They want to say, I want to give you enough money to be able to scale up and scale up fast and to be financially sustainable. And I think you shouldn't uh, be distorted or, or really be misguided by people say, oh, we can talk about that later because you need to find the right kind of investors in the beginning. Uh, bringing in an investor is like a marriage, okay? Uh, it is um, more than just a marriage, I think. You need to really think hard about, you know, how to manage your investors' uh, expectation. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess I, we're kind of at the end of our session. I'm just going to get like everyone. Uh, Ganesh, are you, are you okay? Can, can you guys hear oh, me now? Oh, yay! Okay, finally. <laughs> uh, so just wanting uh, every panel right here uh, to share one or two pointers or tips for our SEs to take away um, and start re-strategizing for their next few months because the next few months are like the most important ones at this point right now already. Okay, so, so my practical advice, um, develop a 13-week cash flow forecast, build it within it your scenario analysis, worst case, base case, you know, um, and best case. Um, figure out your levers, who do you need to manage, your stakeholders, once you have that done, and then hopefully that will tide you across. Uh, over, over the next three, four months, so to speak. Be agile and be innovative. You know, uh, that is important at this, at, this, at this phase. Thank you. Okay, uh, Anjit Rizal? Um, so I say three things. It's, it's the crystallization, what everyone's probably touched on a bit at some point. I, I think number one, I know things seem bleak and dire at this point of time, 
but there's always opportunity in any adversity or challenge. So if this is a time to self-reflect and rethink in terms of what your business model is, what your purpose is, this is the time to do it. If this is time for you to upskill, reskill, capacity build, do it, right? But at the same time, number two is just stay true and stay truthful. I mean, you you were in this for some very good reason, a passion that you were you were trying to pursue. Um, but at the same time, I think as Ganesh was saying, be flexible. Uh, you have a long-term goal, but in the immediate term, you kind of need to do certain hard things, make some hard decisions. If it means uh, doing something that you wouldn't have necessarily done, I'm not saying you know break ethics or anything of that sort, but you kind of need to be you need to, you need to do what you need to do in order to survive the next couple of weeks. And finally, I think this is really key. Everyone's going through this, right? So seek help. Um, go out there, get attention to your situation and seek the help that you need. There are funds out there, there are banks who are out there to help uh, you as well. So it's best for you to actually reach out, be persistent, even if you can't get through the first time, keep trying and trying until you get through. So I, I would say that, just just seek help. Thank you. I, I think we're, we're not in this alone. And I, I guess that with Malaysian spirit, like um, I can see a lot of love and trust you know, being given from the private and public sector as well. Uh, what about like Mason all the way from Singapore? Okay, so I think, um, I think it's important to do not compromise your core values of why you are doing this social enterprise. Your core value is the base of your passion of why you're doing this social enterprise. Um, that is something that I would like to see a, a social entrepreneur to uh, demonstrate that whether your core values remain the same or have changed or been affected. Because investors are attracted by social entrepreneurs with shared core values. So if you know, if you're very passionate about what you're doing and share the same core values with the investors or even funders, you know, you will see through it. I think another important thing is um, don't take rejection too hard. Not every investor or funders is suitable for you. Just because your first 10 uh, meetings with, with potential funders, they reject you means you start to be shaky about your core values, about your thing. Um, you know, again, but you must be sure about your own core values. Um, you know, one day I believe that you will meet the right investors who share your core values. So don't give up. So there's a saying that like investors like invest in the person rather than the project sometimes. You agree with that, Mason? Yes, absolutely correct. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, what about Dasrik? No, you know, you're right. There's, there's a lot of talks around doom and gloom, right? But, but I see there's a lot of opportunity as well in adversity. Um, so, so, so I guess, I guess I, I can't say much. I think everyone else have, have, have said it already. I think my, 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 my thing is that if we do this right, and I'm probably going to, uh, mencap up chamber a bit like So, so we, 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 we try to coordinate ourselves together, whether you're a practitioner in, you know, intermediaries and stuff like that. But the idea here is actually to go through these resiliencies. Um, given the fact, yes, some of you might pivot, which is fine. Given the fact some of you might close shop, hopefully not kalau ada, but we can you know, support through and see how you could sort of uh, pivot out of it. The idea here is actually I feel more than ever, uh, social enterprise can be mainstream in the new economy. So I'm banking on that and I think there's a lot of things that we could do uh, moving forward. So don't take this as a negative thing. Like I said earlier, I think it's just accelerated uh, stuff, what we need to do anyway. So, you know, uh, take up the challenge and inshallah, I think everyone would be able to rise above the challenge. Pun Thank intended. you, Das. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Das, Rick. Uh, I guess that if I were to summarize everyone right here, which the panel is really, really awesome to take out the, their time. They're actually like super busy. Uh, like Ganesh was like saying that it's very, very intense. Um, uh, I, if I want to summarize, survival first. Survival first. Really try and see how you can uh, make sure that you get through this uh, at least in one piece. Uh, and then second, reassess internally your cash flow, your, your, your operational cost, um, your beneficiaries. Reassess uh, before you make the tough decision. And then 
of course, the next one is really making the tough choice. Uh, I, I also understand I'm an entrepreneur myself. It's really, really tough to tell your team that we're really, really sorry. You know, uh, I wanted to do my best, but uh, circumstances didn't allow us to do so. Um, but always remember that's like, uh, and the next one, the last one, which is to reach out. We have like uh, people uh, like from the banking uh, uh, sector, people uh, from the impact investment sector and reach out to CSET as well and uh, reach out to your fellow so social entrepreneurs uh, where you, you can do like a peer-to-peer -peer support with among yourselves. I just did one myself as well. Uh, it's really, really very, very helpful um, because you know that you're not in this alone uh, and, and, and many other people who might, might, might face worse situation than you but might be a very uh, strong core uh, might, might still have a very strong core and values that could inspire you as well. So very important to reach out. So I want to thank all the panel for your time and all the audiences that are listening. It's very, very amazing to see like, um, like we have how many? We have like around, I think at one point we were at 80 over uh, participants uh, to, to be listening to this uh, uh, webinar or like panel. So thank you very much. I hope that everyone uh, could survive this true and if you, uh, I, I really wish everyone all the best and uh, anything please reach out. Thank you very much. I'll pass this to Pamela. Thanks Kim. Thanks a big thank you to all our speakers. I, I, I believe that we once we survive through this we will just be stronger than before. So um, thanks again and this marks the end of our webinar session. So Magic Ourselves, we are actually curating a, a lot more capacity building and online um, courses where it's, it's publicly accessible. So please just follow our social media and, and join us when you can. Um, uh, also, uh, we will send out our feedback form later. We really appreciate if you can give us feedback and maybe we can improve more. So look out for more uh, webinar and, and online sessions from Magic. Um, I think that's all. Thanks very much, our speakers. Um, uh, everyone, have a good weekend. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks Bye. very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.